Hello and welcome back. So let's pick up with learning about the neuron, which is kind of cell in your nervous system that's specialized for communication. Neurons use an electrochemical communication. And so let's talk about the electrical bit first. The, um, the neuron has a, a resting potential. And so when it's not being stimulated or inhibited, so when it's not being turned on or turned off, it's at minus 60 millivolts. It, it is a fundamental property of the universe that there are charged particles. And some particles have a positive charge, like protons, and some particles have a negative charge. Those are electrons. And what is positive and negative mean? It's, it's kind of a, a label. Think of it as um, like a magnet where um, there are two poles on the magnet and we're going kind to of call one of them positive and the other one negative. And the, the two positives don't like each other, right? And the two negatives don't like each other. But a positive and negative attract. So, um, the the textbook had this metaphor about neurotransmitters and cold medication that I don't I think was a bit confusing because it made it sound like the neurotransmitters are, are traveling or what's traveling down the axon. No, it's actually an electrical impulse that travels down the um, down the axon, and um, then the neurotransmitters are stored at the end of the axon in the axon terminal and synaptic vesicles and then if those get the message then they are released um, into the synaptic cleft the gap between two neurons and and travel over to to a receiving neuron for a neuron to fire there has to be um, sort of a change in in potential such that it is it is stimulated to fire it's it's an all or nothing response so um, you can see on this graph here, it's kind of hard to see, I have to get this microphone out of my way. Um, so the resting potential um, is at, so where they have it, say so minus 60, we're gonna put it on the graph there. So they have minus 70 there. Um, okay, so anyway, it, it has to get what, what we call sort of depolarized. And um, that would happen because of, of uh, more positive particles flowing in. And once it reaches this threshold, which is negative 55, um, then off it goes, okay, and it fires. And after it fires, um, it, it then becomes what we call hyperpolarized, where it gets even more negative than it was before. And um, at that point, it, it can't fire again. It, it needs to rest a little bit, okay? And then it, it goes back to, to the uh, resting potential. So neurons can fire about 100 to 1,000 times per second. That's quite a lot. And the longer the axon, uh, the more limited its uh, firing rate is. So the communication inside the neuron, so down the, you know, from the soma down the axon is electrical, but when that electrical impulse gets to the end, um, it results in um, a, a release of neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are, are chemicals like amino acids that have a messaging function. And when they are released into that gap between, between the neurons, they, they have to travel across and they fit into a receptor site on the receiving neuron. And they activate it, and they activate that electrical um, impulse on the uh, on the receiving neuron by locking into that receptor site, like a like a key and a lock. Um, there are many things that can can happen to a neurotransmitter when it's in that synaptic cleft, like it can get across to the other side or it could be broken down by enzymes, or it could escape and run away, or it could get um, taken, um, reabsorbed um, into the uh, original neuron. So the, um, 
synaptic vesicles can, can suck it up again. So the neurotransmitter might not make it all away, all the way across. Um, some neurotransmitters are excitatory, so they cause that um, receiving neuron to, to fire. And some of them are inhibitory. They actually say, you know, don't fire. Uh, every, I left the, the exact words from, from the textbook publishers there. I wanted you to see them because they're a bit, um, the, the textbook warns us about oversimplification, and I think they might be doing it there too. So they say, each neurotransmitter has a specific role and function in the brain and body, um, but it's not, it's way more complicated than that. It's not just one thing. So you've probably heard about serotonin and mood, serotonin and depression. Um, depression is often treated with ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That's a kind of medication that causes the serotonin to uh, stay in that synaptic class cleft for longer, right? It prevents it from getting um, taken up by the um, original neuron. And it, it's kind of like if you hold more, if you hold food in your mouth for longer, maybe you um, you can taste it better. Well, if the neurotransmitter stays in in that synaptic to cleft for for longer, it has more chance to interact with the receiving neuron. Okay, but. Serotonin does so much more than that in the body. So remember how little we know about the brain and about the nervous systems and neurotransmitters. So we know it has something to do with blood clotting, right? We know it has to do with sexual function. We know it has to do with um, um, with digestion. It has something to do with bone health. It has a lot to do with sleep. Serotonin is a, a precursor for melatonin, which is um, involved in your, your sense of sleepiness. So there is, um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that there are six different kinds of neurotransmitters and they each do one thing. So neuroscientists have identified at least 60 and there's probably more they haven't found yet. And we know something about some of the functions of some of the neurotransmitters. So we know that acetylcholine has to do with muscle movement and with memory, but maybe it does a lot of other things that we don't know about. And maybe the the ultimate behaviors or processes that we're interested in um, are, are very complex and they might have to do with um, interactions between, you know, many different neurotransmitters and, and other chemicals in your body. Um, you know, and, and interplay with, with different brain regions, okay? So, so the release of acetylcholine is not the whole story of memory, right? The, the reuptake of serotonin is, is not the whole story of depression. But let's, let's hit some of the highlights, some of the things we, we do know. So um, glutamate and GABA are the most common neurotransmitters in the central nervous system. They're both associated with learning and memory. And glutamate is excitatory, and it increases the chance that neurons will communicate with each other. And it can be toxic in, in high doses. And maybe too much glutamate has something to do with the etiology of, of schizophrenia. Uh, GABA is inhibitory. It dampens neural activity. There is something, a psychoactive substance that we use that um, uh, is a, a, a GABA agonist, which means that it, it acts a bit like GABA in, the neuro, in our nervous system. Anyone know what it is? We use it for partying, but it actually has an, uh, a depressant effect on the body but it might make you feel more free to have fun because it's shutting down your higher level inhibitions, judgments. Yes, yes, yeah, you guys got it. It's alcohol. Um, alcohol is is ethanol and it's a, a tiny little molecule that one of the things it, it, act, it does is act as a GABA agonist, um, but it's it's a, a little molecule that gets all over the place and into lots of, of 
different um, systems and processes in it. And it makes a real hot mess. And in fact, uh, neuroscientists still don't quite know, you know, what's involved chemically in, in drunkenness. Uh, but um, inhibition um, it is part of it. Uh, most drugs that are treatments for anxiety work on the GABA system. You can actually, I have a couple of uh, I have pictures of molecules there, but um, you can you can buy glutamate from from your grocery store. It's um, glutamate occurs naturally in in foods that have um, a sort of umami taste, like I don't know brown rice and soy. So, um, and if you you mix monosodium glutamate, which you can buy in your spice aisle, with something that has a umami flavor, it uh, produces a, a pleasurable effect. But if you mix uh, monosodium glutamate with something sweet, it, it doesn't improve the flavor profile. So people put it in, in soups and, and things like that. Uh, you can buy, you can purchase GABA as a, as, as a supplement over the counter. I've never tried it. Has anyone done that? No, I'm a little hesitant to sort of mess with with my neurotransmitters. But uh, if something's sold as a, a natural health supplement, it, it means that it's um, probably fairly safe. Like you could, um, you know. Not that you should go eat the whole bottle, but but if you did, it maybe you'd get some bad diarrhea or something like that. So you can buy like vitamins over the counter. You can't buy an antidepressant um, or you can't buy clonazepam over the counter. Um, to get some psychoactive substances, you need a prescription from a doctor and you have to get it from a pharmacist. Um, On to acetylcholine. So acetylcholine has an influence on arousal, on selective attention. That's when you decide that you're going to pay attention on something, um, on sleep and on memory. And it also has a role in, in muscle movement. So neurons that connect to muscles and tell the muscle to do something um, release acetylcholine to produce the movement. Alzheimer's dementia is associated with the loss of cholinergic neurons that produce acetylcholine. And in and, and folks who have this condition will will lose their memories to the point that they they don't know they don't remember their past or they might not recognize their family members anymore. And in the later stages, as it progresses, then they lose the ability to control their movement and um, physical abilities like walking, sitting, and, and eventually even swallowing. Then there are the monoamines, and they are norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. I see a question. Does someone with ADHD have an excess of acetylcholine seeing as it affects selective attention? I don't know. Um, there are some. So there, there's a, a book of, of mental disorders that's uh, published by the American Psychiatric Association. And there are some mental disorders that are um, found in different cultures and different social contexts pretty universally. And those are depression and um, schizophrenia. But then there are some things we label as, as disorders that are highly contextual. So, so there'd be a much higher level of social construction. And um, ADHD might make sense in a classroom context, but it would be harder to generalize that out of a, a classroom context. Um, there was a study where um, they were kind of looking at 
brains of, of people who'd been diagnosed with ADHD and then had other scientists look at all of these um, images and try to identify which ones had ADHD. And they weren't much better than chance. I want to look at, at that. I, I need to look up that study. So um, so I think my my answer is is I don't know, but you could uh, look that up on Google Scholar and be aware that that's a condition that's that has a lot more kind of social context and social construction involved. Um, all right, norepinephrine is one of your stress hormones. So when you have when you're having a stress reaction, um, that that's part of what's going on, and so it has to uh, do with arousal with mood, um, with hunger, and with with sleep. And actually, on, on the subject of um, ADD, I was prescribed an ADD drug called Stratera, um, and it's it was an SNRI, a, a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So it meant that I had more the norepinephrine was was hanging around in the synapses for for longer and, and having a greater effect. Um, I got um, very, the, the rationale for it being an ADD drug is that stress makes you focus. Okay, so that's that's the mechanism of, of how Stratera makes you focus more. And, uh, and it certainly did make me focus more. I remember there was a paper that um, I didn't, didn't really like working on. And after I took the pill, I, um, I found it easier to focus on the paper. I'm getting some feedback. Um, um, let me see if I can... Let me see what's going on. Ooh. Um, um, all right, back to uh, where was I? Stratera. And um, I got really so, so that it norepinephrine is involved in, in your your fight or flight response and i ended up with like high blood pressure high heart rate um my doctor thought there was something wrong with my heart um i stopped being hungry lost a lot of weight um since i have and my my level of, of stress hormones ended up being so high that an internal medicine specialist thought that i might have a a rare neuroendocrine tumor called a pheocytochromatoma and um that was that was a kind of a hard time in my life like i i thought that i was like losing everything um and then just being in that kind of really weakened condition and not knowing what was going on i ended up getting um bullied at, at work i have um the other institution i work at is pretty toxic and uh it, it just kind of ended up taking a few years out of my life, but but I learned a lot. Like it changed my direction professionally. It changed my understanding of, of psychology and and systems and and of academia. And um, at the end of the day, I think Stratera did me did me a lot of good. Though I wouldn't want anyone else to go through that. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's silver linings. Uh, there's a, a question. Um, what is the difference between what chemical goes through your neurotransmitters with drug-induced psychosis over psychosis disorder. Um, okay, so some people have like a psychiatric condition where they experience, um, uh, where they experience like hallucinations and delusions and they might get very suspicious and that's associated with so schizophrenia and schizophrenia like conditions and those conditions, those positive symptoms of schizophrenia, we call them positive because they're present. They're, they're also negative symptoms of schizophrenia where people just kind of don't really do much or, or respond much. But, the, but those active hallucinations, delusions, um, we also see that kind of suspiciousness in uh, schizotypal or no. Yeah, schizotypal personality disorder. And that's associated with dopamine. And guess there is, so maybe you have endogenously too much dopamine and it can produce that kind of uh, psychotic disorder. And then uh, you could induce that by, by taking cocaine, which also 
affects the dopamine system. So people who take cocaine have hallucinations. They start to get um, suspicious. They get um, kind of grandiose and brag and, and think they're... Um, think they're they get very confident and maybe they feel superior to other people and in schizophrenia you get these um delusions of grandeur where people think they might um have some kind of divine status for instance and also delusions of, of persecution where they they think that um people are are plotting against them and and also when people take cocaine they can yeah can you hear me now yeah Sorry, I don't know what's hap what happened there or why it why that sometimes happens. All right, let's get back to. Hey, okay. all right. Um, where were we? Um, I think we talked about norepinephrine, which is a stress hormone, um, and then we t uh, dopamine. Okay, that's where we were. So dopamine is associated with your sense of reward, the pleasure of accomplish, accomplish. It has a role in motivation and in feeling successful and having feelings of, of well-being, of power and, and leadership makes you feel um, more social and also more suspicious. Um, and so we can if you want to know what you know a lot of lo dopamine uh, feels like or does to people the the answer to that is is cocaine and it's interesting to observe that uh, you know there are different subcultures around drug use and uh, cocaine seems to be the drug of of choice for professionals like for people who have high status like doctors and lawyers and and managers and celebrities and i wonder i i wonder whether that's because one reason that people have a drive for high status jobs is that you think that will feel good and and you'll feel powerful and, and great. And maybe it's actually not like that. Maybe it's really stressful. Maybe being a corporate lawyer could be kind of sucky. Uh, maybe patients are mad at you. Maybe uh, you're worried you might actually hurt somebody. Maybe, you know, so I wonder if if that has anything to do with that. Like, you can get that feeling from from cocaine. Um, and there's a question somebody asked about the, the use of marijuana and schizophrenia. Like, are they connected? I don't know. That would be the, the way I would look that up is go to Google Scholar and just type in marijuana schizophrenia and, and see what articles come up. And it's uh, best to start with a review article if you can that summarizes across multiple um, multiple articles. Um, and then there's another question. I take Concerta for ADHD, and I was wondering what causes the loss of appetite, like if it's because of a stimulant. Can you tell me what, I don't know anything about Concerta, can you tell me what um, neurotransmitter system effect, like what does it do? If it's something that's um, turning on your, your stress response, then yeah, it would make you eat less because when your body is, is stress when you're having that kind of adrenergic reaction uh, then you focus and you're also less interested in, in in eating it's just part of your fight or flight response oh no no how about now can you hear me now oof um i'm sorry about that um, okay, I, I, I think that people can can hear me. Maybe I should find some way to call in with my phone. Um, okay, I'm glad you guys can hear. Um, where was I? At uh, dopamine and the rewards. Oh, there's a, a comment from, from Shirley. Marijuana is generally much lower in THC than other drugs that are associated with that, like cocaine, for example, even ones that are high in THC don't cause nearly as much in the way as delusions or hallucinations. You'd have to take a significant amount to have anywhere near the same effect. Yeah, cocaine has a, a very strong, very specific effect. Um, marijuana does also um, affect the dopamine system. 
Um, so it gives you a, a bit of a, a dopamine hit where, where you're like, ooh, everything is, is so interesting, right? Dopamine makes you sort of into things, um, makes things sort of rewarding. But uh, with long-term use, um, then your body would down-regulate the production of that. And so everything else would just seem a bit grayer and, and less motivating. Um, there's a comment that someone has gone into it, drug-induced psychosis with just marijuana. I um, I took, I tried marijuana once. It was in an edible. It was a very bad experience. <laughs> I'm never doing that again. I hear it's edibles are worse for addicts. Anyway, um, serotonin. Um, serotonin is the one that you've probably heard about with um, mood, but it has many, many functions in the body. Um, I was looked up a, a rat study on antidepressants, and it uh, it showed that antidepressants that target different systems might um, increase different kinds of activity. So one thing that we know SSRIs do is, is they seem to increase a, a depressed person's activity, and this can make them a, a suicide risk. So if you look at the, the paper insert that comes with an antidepressant that's an SSRI, it, there's a black box warning um, that's, that's about suicide. So people should be monitored for at least the first few, few weeks um, because of that. And it, if somebody's, you know, still having those really depressed cognitions and those that way of thinking and feeling hasn't changed, just increasing their activity level might give them the energy to, to do something that, that we wouldn't want them to do. So in this rat study, um, they put some um, rats in an inescapable container of water. And they, researchers counted the amount of time they spent immobile, like maybe like floating around having given up, or um, being active, like splashing around and trying to climb out. And they compared the, the rates of, of that activity or, or inactivity before and after they um, administered these antidepressant drugs. Uh, drugs. And um, they, they had a, a different drugs had a different effect on different kinds of, uh, of behaviors um, in this very limited context. So with the SSRIs, there was less immobility and more swimming, but it didn't affect climbing. But the SSNRIs, um, you know, increased climbing without affecting the, the swimming. So, you know, the implication is that antidepressants might increase your activity, but not all kinds of activity, not not evenly. Uh, people who take medications that increase serotonin are at risk of something called serotonin syndrome. So if you have too much serotonin in your system, then um, that that's called serotonin syndrome. It looks like agitation, restlessness, insomnia, confusion, fast heart rate, high blood pressure loss of muscle coordination, like twitching, high blood pressure, muscle rigidity, like it's, it's quite dangerous. Um, there are sort of supplements that you can find on, on the shelf in the pharmacy that are related to, to serotonin. Um, so I think L-tryptophan is, is a precursor. Um, you can buy, um, 5-HTP, which is like very close to, to serotonin. And serotonin is used uh, itself as a precursor to something called melatonin. And people take that in order to reset their sleep cycles if they have jet lag or to fall asleep more easily. And then um, L-tyrosine is a dopamine precursor. But you can't, you know, straight up buy dopamine at the pharmacy. Now, we were talking about marijuana, and uh, so that brings me to anen, oh, I can never pronounce this, anandabides. Um, ananda is the, the Sanskrit word meaning happiness, pleasure, and delight. Okay, it brings on feelings of bliss. It also influences eating and motivation and memory and sleep, and it, it THC binds to, to those receptors, okay? And so maybe that's why um, marijuana um, makes people feel good and also get hungry. 
Neuropeptides do a lot of different things in, in your body and have a role in, in hunger, learning, memory. The ones we talk about a lot in psychology are endorphins. And endorphins are basically about um, blocking the, like a pain signal. Okay, so it relieve, they relieve pain. And they can also bring on this feeling of euphoria or, you know, that, that everything's okay. And in nature, let's say an animal is, is being attacked um, and hurt, there would be like an endorphin rush associated with that, which actually helps the animal um, like run away. So it's not like focused on its wounds. It could even euphorically run away, but the point is that it's running away. Um, and synthetic or opioids like um, morphine act on the endorphin system. I have um, taken morphine once and it was when I was in labor and it was an interesting effect because the pain was still there. I thought that it would take the pain away and it didn't. It just kind of changed my attitude where I really didn't care about the pain. I was like, oh yeah, that pain, whatever. It just didn't seem, but before I was like, pain. So the pain is still there, but I just, I didn't really care. I was like more interested in, I don't know, as an effect or something. It, it seemed to change the way I, I related to the pain. I don't know if anyone else has tried morphine before, but um, people do get um, addicted to opioids and they can, they can make people feel really good. Comment there in the chat saying, well, it just made them feel nauseated, but um, and yet people can develop addictions to, to opioids and when they stop taking them. So when they take them, it, you feel like less suffering. But then you develop d dependency. And when you stop taking them, then you're just like flooded with, with suffering. And someone else had the same, same sort of labor experience. It's interesting how like, you know, pain regulation could be sort of, sort of psychological. And it's not actually about the, um, the amount of pain, but the pain is still there. Um, yeah, yeah, they are, the, and opioids are, are very addictive. Um, I wonder if, and, and so if you're going to be prescribed an opioid by by a doctor, there's a lot of controls on that and, and on the dosage, and, you know, you can only get it from a pharmacy and they keep it under lock and key. All right, so there are drugs uh, that are psychoactive. We've already discussed a few of them. Um, and they interact with with your neurotransmitters and they have an effect on mood, arousal or behavior. The most common psychoactive substance, the most commonly used psychoactive substance in the world is, I wonder if you guys can guess. Here's a hint. I just did some. Yeah, it's caffeine. Uh, alcohol is right up there, but it's actually, um, it's actually, you, hopefully you drink more coffee than alcohol. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's caffeine. And caffeine comes to us mostly through, through coffee. Um, and um, you can also get it from, from coca. It's also in chocolate. Uh, what's interesting about coffee is that it is the number one source of antioxidants in the American diet, because usually we get those from fruits and veg vegetables, but we probably drink more coffee than we eat vegetables. Uh, and there's a recommendation there for a uh, TV show called Dope Sick, Dope Sick about the opioid crisis. And it's I, would, I would actually be very interested in that. And actually a student in my other um, intro psych class recommended um, a movie that was about um, about the fentanyl crisis. So I actually do very much want to watch that. Um, so these psychoactive uh, drugs come in in two main forms. There's the agonists and the antagonists. And so an agonist um, increases the activity of that neurotransmitter system. So for example, morphine, mimics endorphins they kind of they fit into that uh like the counterfeit key that fits into that lock okay so that's an agonist and then um an antagonist decreases the activity um, of the neurotransmitter system and so some treatments 
or um, schizophrenia are based on um, blocking the activity uh, of the, the dopamine neurotransmitter system. Another example is uh, curare. Um, some uh, tribes use arrows that uh, they dip into some kind of a poison. And if you get hit by that arrow, then, then you're sort of paralyzed. And what curare does is, is that it's an acetylcholine agonist, and that interferes with your ability to move, which we know is based on choline. So, yes, there's all kinds of drugs and supplements that can um, uh, modulate your neurotransmitter supplements, but you can also support your neurotransmitter systems with a healthy lifestyle. So, where do you get GABA from? Okay, it's, it's right in, you can find it directly in food. And it's in that um, uh, kind of umami food. It's in fermented food. It's in tea, right? Uh, soybeans, mushrooms. And it's in vegetables like um, spinach and the cruciferous vegetable, vegetables. Um, Tryptophan is, a, is the serotonin precursor. And you find that in these kind of protein foods. It's, there's a lot in egg yolk. Um, in cheese, pineapple, soy, salmon, nuts and seeds, and uh, turkey. Dopamine precursors are in uh, like coffee and chocolate. Um, anandamide is precursors of arach arachidonic acid, and you find that in, in sardines, salmon, eggs, poultry. And meat, the only vegetarian source is seaweed. And you can get uh, precursors for endorphins and in, in coca and in peppers, and all the peppers from like black peppers, chili peppers, green peppers, and um, and and in oranges. And also, what also what um, promotes will give you a bit of an endorphin rush are, are exercise and and sunshine and laughter and sex. So what's interesting about um, the, these foods that support your neurotransmitter systems is that they all look like foods that, that are part of a really healthy diet. And um, what the image you have there is, is from the Canada Food Guide. I think that's the most recent version, which is uh, a big improvement from, on the food guides from the 90s that had a lot of um, sort of agricultural interests in them. The American Food Guide from the 90s was like, you should be eating tons and tons of grain and drinking a lot of milk because like the, the dairy farmers of America or whatever right? kind of got in on that. Anyway, we have a much better food guide now. And um, what is interesting about this is that it's telling you that half your diet, like in terms of volume, like half your plate should be vegetables and fruits. Like go back and look about this. Like most of that stuff is like veggies and really high quality proteins. Um, uh, a colleague of mine is a teaches nutrition at, at Dalhousie University, and she thinks that this is like not quite enough vegetables. They should have made it 75 percent of, of the plate. Um, I have I see a couple of questions there. Um, someone finds helping uh, taking vitamin D3 helps them. I'm, I'm glad to, to hear that. Um, I um, have tendencies towards depression. And I know taking B vitamins makes a huge difference. Um, I take like a mega dose every day and um, that, that helped me a lot. And I see another comment. I'm vegetarian and take B12. Is that to support anandamide levels? No, that's because um, you usually get B12 from animal sources. And so if you are, so vegans need to supplement that. I think you might be able to, um, to get that from I mean, if you're vegetarian, you still eat other animal sources and, and milk, but that is a, a boost that definitely vegans uh, need to get. Yeah, and uh, and there's a comment there from Shirley saying that the milk thing has been debunked. It doesn't actually help your bones. It mainly started as a way to, to boost the dairy farming economy. So there is a lot of um, economic interest in promoting certain foods as, as healthy. And um, there... There was this whole milk and calcium thing, and we actually get enough calcium in our diets. Like none of us are calcium deficient and need to go drink more milk to get the calcium. It's the bone thing is actually more about a calcium magnesium balance. And if we 
what we really need to do is go get more magnesium from these like dark leafy greens that we don't eat enough of. Um, so yeah, good. It, it's good to be um, good to be on to this stuff with uh, you know the way that economic interests affect research and and psychology or health research. There was there was a lot of studies about like how bad milk is that were funded by the soy industry, and a lot of studies on how bad soy is that were funded by the dairy industry. Um, but my point here is that you know eating like a, a healthy diet where you have a lot of different um, colors of, of vegetables and, and fruits, you know, not just the green ones, but the yellow ones and the orange ones and, and, and the red ones, um, you get compounds from those foods that, um, that your body needs. But is that how most people eat, right? Probably not. Um, what you see here is, is known as the SAD, the, the SAD, the standard American diet. So most people don't eat like that. And in fact, you know, if you go to the grocery store and groceries are getting expensive these days, you know, the most expensive places in the grocery store are probably the produce aisle and, and, the, and the protein foods and the, and the meat aisle. Um, and what I would say most people eat is like a, a lot of refined carbohydrates. So a lot of people would think that, say, granola bars or Nutri-Grain bars are healthy because there's some oats in there. But, you know, there's if you read the ingredient list, it might be like oats, sugar, like six different kinds of sugar. Those blueberry muffins that you get at um, Tim Hortons or McDonald's, they're not made with real blueberries. There's little like blueberry, you know, they have dough that's like blue colored and that has like sugar and flavor in it. And then they mix that. And like it's not, they're not really blueberries. <laughs> okay. Um, and so what most people eat is is a lot of processed grains. So even, you know, you know, are Cheerios healthy? Well, no, that's a super, super ref refined grain. It's it's extruded, it's it's really highly processed. And there's a lot of processed meat and and processed cheese, refined oils. There are a lot of chemicals and that are added to add kind of flavor and, and texture. And, you know, you don't necessarily know how, how your body reacts to those. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of sugar and candies. And often the only vegetable is the ketchup. In fact, there was a school, there's a story about a school board in the States where they tried to like pass off ketchup as, as a vegetable. Um, I'm going to, I see a few comments in the chat and I'm going to read through those. Um, the first one is about ADHD. Um, yeah, so there's a comment there that, that relates to the role of serotonin in sleep. You have too much serotonin, you can't, can't sleep. Um, yes, I agree that, you know, it can be confusing to navigate what's healthy and there's a lot of, there's, there's a lack of education. I noticed that some of my more, um, People with lower socioeconomic status often have less of that knowledge. You see a lot more of that kind of healthy eating in higher SES groups where, you know, they, you know, they, they don't touch, you know, white sandwich bread. Um, yeah, and I agree with, with Jane. I think the research supports that is like the less processed, the better. Um, yeah, like a lot of people don't read the ingredient uh, lists and, and my partner's like that like he just falls for um you know the idea that something is healthy because it has oats like you know oatmeal raisin cooking he's down like no it's full of sugar and, and, and um and uh once i he bought some vegetable oil from from the superstore and, and had a picture of like celery and tomato and i asked him like do you think that this oil is made from the vegetables on the picture I actually thought so but it was like no name vegetable oil. So it was like soybean oil and canola oil. But uh, he fell for the pictures of the vegetable. A lot of people will kind of fall for that, that marketing level. Um, and there's another question about um, finding more about ADHD. Um, I don't, I, I think that would be a clinical psychologist uh, would, would be in, that would be their domain. Yes, yeah, it's also in canola. <laughs> but I had a picture of vegetables that looked very salad-y. 
All right. So, um, you know, this is probably the way most people eat. And and what about uh, the exercise and, and the sunlight and, and the laughter and the romance? Oh, are you getting enough of that? Well, you know, the way a lot of people live is to spend all day working on a screen um, in a windowless office. Or let's say you, a lot of people work retail. Let's say you're working retail in a mall. There's probably no windows. I work um, under my, I had an office space at, uh, at SMU where I was for three years with no windows. I wouldn't know whether it was raining outside, right? Whether it was winter or summer or fall, it was just, just a room and, and a screen. Um, we spend a lot of time commuting that can be stressful. Um, you know, post COVID we're getting more, more remote work. But, but at the end of a day like that, that's full of, you know, you might just feel tired, you know, and like you don't have the energy to fix a healthy dinner. Or, or So maybe what you do is grab some processed food and, and relax at the TV and, you know, with, you know, some, some beer. And the average amount of time that people spend watching TV, not just like in front of a computer screen, but watching TV um, is it's about one to four hours per day, and it works out to about nine years by the time you're 65. Um, and, you know, do people have the energy or the time for, you know, friends or relationships or, you know, maybe it's easier to just try to access it through social media, but, you know, that's that's not the same thing, right? And, you know, does that tempt us to find other ways to to relax or or feel more awake or more successful? Um, I think this is a, a good place to to stop, but um, I, I learned a lot from from preparing this lecture about the importance of lifestyle. Um, it's kind of not surprising if you know a lot of people end up with. Um, issues with their mood or, or their energy or with anxiety. Are there, are there any, any questions or any other comments? I see a, a one about uh, smart water. Um, so is smart water some kind of distilled water? I remember distilled water from like biology class. I'd use it in experiments. You can just use any old tap water. Oh, does it bind with more stuff? Oh, I'm going to stop the recording. I forgot to do that here. Let me stop the recording.